Midnight for Charlie Bone, Chapter 5, Trapped in the Dark. Uncle Peyton, you're a vandal, said Charlie. A rich, throaty chuckle echoed down the narrow street. Charlie had hardly ever heard his uncle laugh before. Someone's going to get blamed for this, he said seriously, and I bet it won't be you. Of course not, said Peyton. Come on, dear boy. We'd better get back before your poor mother starts to worry. As they sped through the city, Charlie had to keep taking little runs in order to keep up with his uncle's long strides. The faster I go, the more energy I burned, explained Peyton, so there's less left over for accidents. Can I ask you something, Uncle Peyton? You can ask, but I might not answer, said Peyton. When did it happen? I mean, can you remember when you found out that you could make lights brighter? Peyton said wistfully, it happened on my seventh birthday. I was so excited, I shattered all the light bulbs. There was glass everywhere. Children were screaming and pulling out pieces of their hair. They all went home early, and I was left confused and unhappy. I didn't realize that I had caused it all until my sisters told me. They were very pleased. Thank goodness he's normal, they said, as if shattering glass was normal and being ordinary was not. My parents were overjoyed. I had no other talents, you see. They let me finish everybody's ice cream, and then I was sick. Did you mind, asked Charlie, being a U-beam when you found out that it meant being different? Just a few doors from number nine, Uncle Peyton came to a halt. Look, Charlie, he said gravely, you'll find out that it's just a question of managing things. If you keep quiet about your talent, then all will be well. Keep it in the family, as they say, and never use it for frivolous reasons. Benjamin knows about the voices, Charlie confessed, but he won't tell anyone. I'm sure he won't, said Peyton, moving on again. He's an odd little fellow. For all we know, he too might be a child of the Red King. The who? asked Charlie. Peyton sprang up the steps of number nine. I'll tell you about him another time, he said. By the way, I wouldn't mention the bookseller to Graham Bone if I were you. He opened the front door before Charlie could ask why. Behind the door stood Grandma Bone, her face like thunder. Where have you two been? she demanded. None of your business, Griselda, said Peyton, striding past her. Are you going to tell me, she asked Charlie. Leave the boy alone, said Peyton, marching up the stairs. A second later, the door closed with a bang. Charlie ran into the kitchen before Grandma Bone could question him again. His mother was alone, reading a newspaper. I was with Uncle Peyton, Charlie told her, just walking. Oh, she looked anxious. I suppose you know what his, what he does? Yes, it's okay, Mom. It doesn't worry me. In fact, it's a relief to know there's someone else in the family who can do do something peculiar. Charlie couldn't stifle a yawn. Today, he'd walked farther than he'd ever walked in his life, and faster. I think I'd better go to bed, he said. He was about to fall asleep when he remembered the keys in his jacket pocket. He felt they should be well hidden. Grandma Bone would probably search his room tomorrow. She was already suspicious. Why did she have to know absolutely everything? It wasn't fair. He pulled, put the keys in the toe of one of his soccer shoes. Hopefully she wouldn't want to look in such a smelly place. Next morning, after breakfast, Charlie collected the bag of keys and put them back in the inside pocket of his jacket. Unfortunately, there was a loud jangling noise when he leaped down the last three steps of the stairs. This happened just as Grandma Bone was coming out of the kitchen. What's that noise, she asked. My pocket money, said Charlie. No, it isn't. Show me what you've got tucked in your jacket. Why should I? Charlie asked very loudly. He hoped that someone would come and rescue him. Have you got my paper, Charlie? Asked Uncle Peyton, peering over the railing. Not yet, said Charlie gratefully. He's not going anywhere until he shows me what he's hiding, said Grandma Bone. Uncle Peyton gave a sigh of irritation. I've just given the boy a handful of coins for the newspaper. Really, Griselda, don't be so childish. How dare you? For a moment, Grandma Bone looked as she, if she were about to burst with indignation. Charlie seized his chance. He leapt past the fuming figure and ran out the front door. Just before he slammed it behind him, he heard Grandma Bone say, You'll regret this, Peyton. Charlie raced across the road to Benjamin's house. He had to ring the bell several times before the door was opened. What do you want? Benjamin was still in his pajamas. I've got the keys to the case, said Charlie. Can I come in? Mom and Dad are asleep, said Benjamin gloomily. I won't make a noise, I promise. Okay. Benjamin reluctantly let Charlie into the house. Then, in bare feet, he padded to the closet under the stairs. You can do it, he said, opening the door. 
Don't you want to see what's in the case? said Charlie. No. Don't be like that, Ben, Charlie begged. It's not my fault that I'm going to that horrible school. You don't think I want to, do you? I can't do anything about it, or Mom and Maisie will be turned out on the street. Will they? Benjamin's eyes widened. Grandma Bone owns the house, and yesterday when my aunts got to hear about me and the photograph voices, they came and gave me a test. If I don't do what they want, they'll turn us out. Mom and Maisie haven't got a penny. Benjamin gasped. So that's what your horrible visitors were doing? Charlie nodded. They said I've got to go to the academy because I'm endowed. You know, the photo thing. I tried to pretend I wasn't, but they tricked me. They gave me such noisy photographs I couldn't even hear my own voice. Mean things, Benjamin said contritely. I'm sorry, Charlie. I thought you'd been keeping secrets from me. No way. I just didn't want to break the news on your birthday, said Charlie. There was a low bark from above, and the boys looked up to see Runner Bean sitting halfway down the staircase. He seemed reluctant, reluctant to come any farther. Come on, Runner. Come and see what's in the case, coaxed Benjamin. Runner Bean couldn't be coaxed. He whined softly, but didn't move. Suit yourself, said Benjamin. He opened the closet door and stepped inside. Charlie was about to follow when Benjamin said, It's gone. Are you sure? Charlie didn't like the sound of this. I put it behind a bag of clothes. The bag's gone, and so is the case. Benjamin crashed around in the closet, moving brooms and boxes, lifting books, kicking at boots. It's not here, Charlie. I'm really sorry. Benjamin emerged from the closet. Go and ask your mom where she's put it, said Charlie. I can't. She gets really angry if I wake her up on Sunday morning. Benjamin began to bite his lip. Luckily, before Benjamin could get too upset, Runner Bean distracted him by rushing down the stairs and leaping to the back door. He stood on his hind legs, planted his paws in the glass pane, and barked furiously. The boys ran to the door, reaching it just in time to see a bright flash disappear behind a tree. The flames, breathed Charlie. Flames? What flames? asked Benjamin. Charlie told him about Mr. Onimus and his cats. Oh, cats, said Benjamin. No wonder Runner's in such a state. Charlie would always wonder if what happened next had anything to do with Mr. Onimus's three flames, for it was the cats that caused them to run to the back door, and if they hadn't, they would never have heard the faint tapping that came from behind another door, a door right beside them. Mm -hmm. What's in there, asked Charlie. The cellar, said Benjamin. It's dangerous. The steps are rotten. We never go in there. Somebody does. Charlie opened the door. At his feet, there was a very small amount of floor and then a dark nothingness. Charlie cautiously stepped through the door and looked down. He could just make out a rickety looking step ladder leaning down into the darkness. A faint tap came from the bottom of the steps and then it stopped. There's a light, said Benjamin, pressing a switch inside the door. A light bulb hanging from the ceiling of the cellar lit a dusty, almost bare room. And now Charlie could see how precarious the steps were. Some were cracked and others had completely fallen away. Dad keeps saying he's going to fix them, but he never has time, said Benjamin. I'm going down, Charlie announced. He could see the bright silver case laying beside the last step. Don't, said Benjamin. You'll have a terrible accident and it'll be my fault. No, it won't, Charlie began to descend. I've got to open that case. Why, wailed Benjamin. Runner Bean gave an accompanying howl. I want to know what's in it before I get into the academy. Whoops, Charlie's foot slipped. He turned to cling one of the stronger steps and continued the rest of the way, holding on to the sides of the ladder while his feet found the steps that could still bear his weight. In this way, with a few cracks and slithers, he managed to reach the cellar floor. Bring the case up here, said Benjamin, kneeling as close as he dared. Charlie was already trying to fit the first key into the lock. I think I'll do it down here, he said. You never know what, what might come out of it. The first key didn't fit. Neither did the second. No sound came from the case, and Charlie began to wonder if the strange tapping hadn't been the water pipes or even a rat under the floorboards. He tried the third key, but had no luck with that either. Miss Ingledew had given Charlie ten keys, and as he tried the fifth, he had a feeling that none of them would fit the silver case. Some of them were too large even to go into the lock. With a sigh, Charlie pulled out the sixth key. No luck, asked Benjamin. Zilch, said Charlie. It's freezing down here. I think I'll... He was interrupted by a loud rap on the front door. Runner Bean barked and Benjamin stood up. What shall I do? He said in a panicky voice. 
Better see who's there before your parents wake up, Charlie advised, and shut the cellar door in case whoever it is comes into the house. But Charlie didn't mention the light. But in his anxiety, Benjamin thoughtlessly turned it off before he closed the cellar door. Hey, Charlie whispered as loud as a whisper could get. Benjamin had gone. Charlie was alone in the dark. He could see neither the case nor the keys. He could feel them, though, and as he ran his hand over the rippled surface of the case, he noticed that there was a small indentation in the side. Slowly, his fingers traced the words, Tally 12 Bells. Benjamin's mind was racing as he went to open the door. He tried to imagine who would be on that doorstep so early on a Sunday morning. Should he let them in, and if he did, could he get back to Charlie, who he now realized he'd left in the dark? Benjamin opened the door just a little and peered around it. A woman stood on the step. She had black hair and she wore a dark, sleek-looking coat. Although she'd been half hidden by an umbrella the last time he saw her, Benjamin had a very good idea who she was. He recognized the red boots. It was one of Charlie's U-beam aunts. He said, yes, but he didn't open the door any farther. Hello, dear. The woman had a sticky, sweet sort of voice. You must be Benjamin. Yes, said Benjamin. Is my great nephew here, Charlie? I know he's a friend of yours, she smiled sweetly. Benjamin was saved the trouble of answering immediately because Runner Bean gave a deep, throaty growl. The woman laughed half-heartedly. Oh, dear, he doesn't like me, does he? She said. Benjamin had come to the conclusion that he must on no account tell this U-beam person where Charlie was. He's not here, he said. I haven't seen him since yesterday. Really? The aunt raised a long black eyebrow. She wasn't smiling anymore. How strange. He said he was coming to see you. No, he didn't, said Benjamin. Oh, and how would you know? She had lost every ounce of her sweetness. Because he'd be here if he had, said Benjamin, without a moment's hesitation. At this moment, Runner Bean began to bark quite ferociously, and Benjamin was able to close the door in the woman's face. When he'd locked and bolted it, he peeked through the spy hole and saw the woman glaring in at him. Her face was white with rage. Benjamin jumped away from the door and tiptoed back to the cellar. Charlie, he whispered, opening the cellar door, it's one of your aunts. No. Charlie's harsh whisper swam out of the darkness. Turn on the light, Ben. Sorry. Benjamin pressed the light switch and looked down to see Charlie kneeling beside the case. Which Anne is it? asked Charlie. She's got black hair, a long dark coat, red boots, and a white face, Benjamin said softly. Benicia, breathed Charlie. She's the tricky one. She doesn't look as if she's going to move off our front step. You better go out the back way. But Charlie had four more keys to try before he gave up in disgust. None of them fitted. I've got to find it, he cried. She'll hear you, Benjamin warned. I'm coming up. Charlie began to climb the steps. It was harder this time. Some of the steps had broken on his way down, and in some places, he had to pull himself up with his hands. Ouch, he gasped as a splinter speared his thumb. Shh, hissed Benjamin. At last, Charlie reached the top step, and together, the boys crept down the passage to the front door. Benjamin pressed his eye to the spy hole. She's gone, he said. I don't know if that's worse or better, said Charlie. She could be anywhere, waiting to pounce. Go through the garden at the back, and then you can look over the wall and see if she's there, suggested Benjamin. You'll have a better chance that way. Good thinking, said Charlie. They went to the back door with Runner Bean barking excitedly, expecting a walk. Your parents can sleep through a lot of this, Charlie remarked. They're tired, said Benjamin, and then he asked, why is it so important to open the case? Can't we just leave it locked up forever? We could dump it in the garbage can or something. No way, said Charlie. The thing inside it was there when the baby was swapped. It's bound to help Miss Ingledew get her back. We've got to keep it safe. Suppose it's something horrible that no one wants. Charlie had considered this, but decided that it was something someone wanted very much. Why were his aunts so interested? Why was a boy with red hair asking for it? Someone wants it all right, said Charlie, but they're not going to get it until I find the baby, and according to Mr. Onimus, the baby is at Bloor's Academy. He opened the back door, jumped on the steps, and raced across the garden. Benjamin watched his friend dash through the gate without bothering to look either way. He was bound to be caught by that horrible aunt. Benjamin sighed. Sometimes Charlie didn't think too carefully about what he was doing. Runner Bean looked so disappointed about the walk he hadn't had that Benjamin decided to make him a big breakfast.
The thought of grilled sausages made him feel hungry himself. In the middle of the kitchen table, there was a white card with the words Orville, Animus, and Flames printed in gold lettering. How and when did the car get th card get there, and why? Charlie had reached the end of the alley behind Benjamin's house. He was now in the street where he'd first seen his uncle boosting the lamps. A quick glance to the left and right told him that his aunt was not in the street. Maybe I fooled her, muttered Charlie. He ran up to Filbert Street, turned the corner, and... Got you, said a voice. Aunt Venetia sank her long nails into Charlie's shoulder. You're coming with me, little boy, she cooed nastily. We've got something to ask you, and if we don't get the right answer, you'll be sorry. Very sorry. <laughs>